Hi, this is Remembering the Past with Corey Franklin, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. Tonight our feature subject is Sir Robert Edwards. Sir Robert Edwards died recently at the age of 87. He was the physiologist who developed the concept of in vitro fertilization. Sir Robert had been working on genetics and fertilization techniques in animals, and in the 1960s he teamed with the gynecologic surgeon Patrick Steptoe, and together they developed the technique whereby a baby could be conceived outside the human body, which led to the first test tube baby in 1978, Louise Brown. Dr. Edwards won the 2010 Nobel Prize in Medicine for the technique of in vitro fertilization. In the past 35 years, the technique has been used millions of times by infertile couples all over the world. Here's a report on the work of Dr. Robert Edwards in the field of in vitro fertilization. Her birth caused a sensation. Louise Brown was the world's first test tube baby. What seemed a miracle then is now commonplace. But in an interview given two years ago, Professor Edwards said that at the time, some regarded it as unnatural. Because the press were chasing it all over. All over, all over Bristol and England, secretly, Patrick Steptoe hid the mother in his car and drove around to his mother's house in Lincoln. His idea was simple, to fertilise an egg with sperm in a dish and then implant it back into the womb. Absolutely earth-shattering work. He's the man who's created hope for millions of infertile couples around the world who otherwise would not have had a baby if this technique hadn't been... Invented. In the early days, there were problems. Pregnancies were hard to achieve, and when they were, there were often multiple births. Over the years, though, it's become a safe and reliable technique. But it's not widely available on the NHS. And in private clinics, each attempt can cost thousands. The technology has also led to the use of embryos for cloning and stem cell research. Louise, with her mum and her son Cameron, who was conceived naturally, helped Dr. Edwards celebrate the 30th anniversary of IVF two years ago. It's a technology that's now become widely used and transformed the lives of millions across the world. As I said before, he won the 2010 Nobel Prize in Medicine and Physiology for the work in in vitro fertilization. Unfortunately, Dr. Steptoe died in 1988, so he was not eligible for the prize. Here's a nice interview in 2010 with one of the Swedish scientists on the Nobel Committee. With me to discuss this prize is Professor Krista Hörg, a member of the Nobel Prize Committee. Professor Hörg, thank you very much for talking to us. Could we begin by you telling us who has received the 2010 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine? It was Robert Edwards received the prize for the development of in vitro fertilization. Uh, in vitro fertilization is a method through which uh, egg can be fertilized outside the body and then return to the woman, in the woman giving rise to a baby in a natural way. And what was Robert Edwards' achievements in IVF therapy? He, he started to work on this in the late 1950s. Initially, he was studying female and male germ cells in animals, trying to understand the reproduction process there. But already during the light, late 1950s, he realized that much of what, what he knew could perhaps be used to treat infertility in humans. So starting perhaps in the end of 1950, 1950s, he had a vision that he could use his knowledge and others' knowledge to transform this into a method to treat infertility. And the first thing he actually did was to find out how human oocytes could be matured in vitro. During a 10-year period, he showed step by step that they could be matured in vitro. That is, you took out through a surgical procedure, you took out immature oocytes from the women, you let them mature in vitro, and in the end, you could give them sperm. And he could show, and he was the first to show, that you could actually in vitro fertilize those oocytes that had been in, matured in vitro outside the body. So at that time point, it was a major success. It happened in 1969. It was in media all over the world. It was a fantastic success in that sense. However, he also came to the re realization that the in vitro matured oocyte was a bit fragile. So he decided to shift focus and initiated collaboration with a very skilled obstetrician and gynecologist, uh, Dr. Patrick Steptoe, that unfortunately died in 1988. And together with him, he, he were able to retrieve uh, mature oocytes instead of immature oocytes. And having access to these mature oocytes, he could then start over again by in vitro fertilizing those in a cell culture dish. And then, in this particular case, he could see that they formed early embryos. 
And that was be coming close to the end of his vision. Because now, not a few years later, his method then resulted in the birth of the first IVF child, Louise Brown. That was in uh, 1978. So where are we now with IVF therapy? What, how prevalent is it and how successful is it nowadays? Depending on the country you look at, it varies from country to country how much the IVF is used. But if you look in, in Western countries or in developed countries, between 1-5% to 5 of the children born are through IVF. Where does IVF therapy fit within uh, all the other prizes that have been awarded the medicine prize? It's clearly a medicine prize and it's clearly a clinical application. And if you look in the history, I would say that this is the one, one of the first prizes awarded in the area of reproduction. Looking into the particular areas, it is unique. Uh, the reason was that he, he was the one that, that saw the possibility. He started this uh, many, many years ago. And he had many collaborators throughout these years, but each of them helped him with a spe specific task. And through the, in, the, in the end, it was really uh, uh, Edward that came out as seeing the vision and making it happen. As you said earlier, the key work was done in the 1960s and 1970s. What was required to, for, for, for this prize to be sort of the most compelling choice this year, decades later in 2010? The reason why it was awarded this year is that it is a very particular case when, when there is a medical award, an achievement like this, you of course have to look into the effect of the children. And during the last years, there have been very, uh, several long-term follow-up studies of the health of these children, which have shown them to be healthy. Furthermore, a number of those IVF children have had kids of their own, and uh, they are healthy, I and mean, they happen without IVF. So, it, all these things coming together, in the end, it was felt that this is a prize that can be given without regrets. Was the ethical issue something that the committee had to consider when awarding this prize? It is true that it was a large ethical discussion at, um, during the 1970s, 19, early 1980s, but those issues have been resolved when it comes to IVF itself, the basal technology of IVF. That is no longer, I think, debated in any country as a technique used. Then, of course, there are follow-up techniques based on IVF. Those uh, could be more or less uh, discussed in different societies in different countries, but this year's prize is, is awarded only for the core technology, IVF as such. We are only focusing on the, actually the, the IVF procedure, and in IVF, the embryo, which is uh, dividing a few times and then return to the mother. We are not considering in any other aspect of the embryo in this prize. Well, as Dr. Edwards noted before, and as we've noted previously with other medical breakthroughs, it was controversial when it first came out. Here, one of Dr. Edwards' colleagues talks about the initial controversy over IVF. In 1969, when the paper in Nature describing fertilization in human eggs came out, the press reaction was by and large hostile, and the professional reaction was extraordinarily negative right through the 70s, really. There were people were publicly criticizing him, the churches were lamming into him. Most scientists were dismissive of him, and most clinicians were dismissive of the work. It was only when Louise Brown was born in, in 78 that attitudes began to soften and change. Finally, here is the reaction when he won the Nobel Prize in 2010. The work at this Cambridgeshire clinic has affected people right across the globe, millions of people. Today, that work was recognised with a Nobel Prize. If you just take a look at this picture, this is the recipient, Professor Robert Edwards, 85 now. Through the 50s, 60s and 70s, he developed a fertility treatment, which has commonly become known as IVF. And it led to the first test tube baby, Louise Brown, born in 1978. If you take a look at these pictures, this was her 30th birthday. And uh, she's there with Robert Edwards. And uh, got some amazing figures for you. Since uh, the IVF programme began, 10,000 babies have born, been born from here. Four million right across the globe. Well, Kay worked with him for 26 years. Kay, you must be delighted with today's news. Absolutely, absolutely. Overjoyed, elated, overwhelmed. We are also very, very proud. His, his work expanded into several different fields of medicine and science, stem cell research, pre-implantation genetics, cryobiology. He really has... Um, created a revolution, a revolution in medicine. And you said for you to work with them was a privilege, is that right? Absolute, an immense privilege. Bob is a visionary and it has been such a privilege to be a part of his extraordinary work.
And um, he's affected so many people's lives, isn't he? Absolutely. He's changed the face of society, really, the work that he did. Sir Robert Edwards. Well, we're going to move on now to Annette Funicello, who died recently at the age of 70. And I think it's safe to say Annette was the greatest Mouseketeer of them all. Annette was a nice Italian girl from Utica, New York, whose family moved out to Bakersfield. She was personally selected by Walt Disney in 1955 because she had that something when she was a little girl. And when you think of Mouseketeers, you think of Annette. And when you think of beach blanket bingo movies, you think of Annette. Here's a report on Annette Funicello. Annette Funicello died today at a hospital in Bakersfield of complications from multiple sclerosis. Let's take a live look right now. This is Funicello's star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Of course, to many people, she will always be remembered from her days as a Mouseketeer. Cast as one of the original Mouseketeers on TV's Mickey Mouse Club, Annette Funicello danced and sang her way into America's heart. That's what I said on my audition for Walt Disney. He said, can you sing a song? And I said, I'm sorry, I don't sing. It didn't matter that she didn't consider herself a singer. The Disney people, recognizing star quality, built musical numbers around her and designed her own show within a show, a miniseries titled appropriately, Annette. After Funicello outgrew the Mickey Mouse Club, they made sure she had sizable roles in other Disney TV series and movies. Vacation is here, beach party tonight. While still under contract at Disney, Funicello began appearing in beach party movies, usually opposite Frankie Avalon. Frankie dragged me to the beach. We never did these with Like we were going to save the world. Just had great fun with it. Those films were heavy on bikinis, but Walt Disney insisted Funicello not be involved in any suggestive sequences and never uncover her navel. After holding her secret close for years, Funicello eventually announced that she suffered from multiple sclerosis. There's a reason for this, and I, I know it's to help others. Her public courage and cheerfulness, even as she faced increasing pain and decreasing mobility, was in keeping with what we'd come to expect from our most famous Mouseketeer. We treasured Annette Funicello as part of Americana when things were simpler and happier, and she looked back with nothing but fondness. Well, as the reporter said, they used to construct special shows for Annette. Walt Disney picked her out when she was a ballerina as a little girl, so they would occasionally have her dance ballet while the other Mouseketeers looked on. Here's a ballet number with the music written by the Sherman Brothers. You'll remember we did Robert Sherman last year. They were the Disney songwriters. Who's the little lady? Who's the baby has a dream? Who's the one you can forget? I'll give you just three guesses. Anna, Anna, Anna. When she dances on her toes, she dances in your heart with her pretty pair. Well, a couple years after that, when Annette got a little older, she filled out her sweater before the other girls. So let's just say Annette was a minor icon to a lot of boys in the late 50s. She also got into rock and roll. She was in that safe period between when Buddy Holly died and when the Beatles came on the scene. And she did a couple of songs. She was the muse and sort of the girlfriend for two of Paul Anka's big hits. And they called it Puppy Love and Put Your Head on My Shoulders. But this is a Paul Anka free zone, so we don't play much Paul Anka here. But the Disney people had her record a couple of her own songs, including Tall Paul, which made it to the top ten in the Billboard charts in the early 60s. Another Sherman Brothers composition. Granted, that's your early 60s rock and roll junk, but a lot of people listened to it at the time, and the fact that it was Annette made even more people listen to it. Here she has a pretty nice, winsome version of a Chubby Checker classic. Don't forget, in 61, 62, everybody was doing the twist. This was Disney's way of keeping Annette hip while everything was starting to change. Come on, everybody! 
about you but I find that undeniably compelling. Here's Ken Levine, the LA scriptwriter who writes The Marvelous Blog and did a great tribute to Bonnie Franklin writing about Annette Funicello. This one hit me hard, very hard. Me and 50 million baby boomers. Annette Funicello passed away yesterday at age 70. She had a major and lasting impact on all our lives. We were the first generation weaned on television. Even though our screens were 12 inches, the images were only in black and white, there were only a handful of channels, and often the reception was snowy or blurry. Television was the most amazing, wonderful, incredible invention of all time. Think of your awe when you first saw the iPhone and the things it could do. Now multiply that by a million. That was TV in the late 50s. Every afternoon, every one of us came home and turned on this magic box, and we all watched the exact same show, The Mickey Mouse Club on ABC. It was on five days a week, and it starred kids just like us. They were peppier than we were, could sing and dance better, and were cuter, but it was still us reflected back on our television screens. We got to know these kids, the Mouseketeers, Cheryl, Bobby, Lonnie, Cubby, Karen, Doreen, and a bunch of others, and Annette. Annette was the one who stood out, and I can't tell you why exactly. There was something special about her. She always seemed so accessible, so nice. Not that the other girls weren't, but I got a vibe, even at six, that they had stage mothers just off camera ready to ground them if they sang a wrong note. And that seemed regular, which therefore made her special. At a time when girls were this complete mystery to me, I still felt that if I knew Annette in real life, that she would be my friend. She wouldn't care that I was younger and kind of goofy looking and couldn't sing or dance if the Nazis were holding my parents. She would still accept me. Now multiply that by 50 million. And that was also the first Mouseketeer to noticeably um, develop. She stood out in that way too. If she wasn't every little boy's first crush before, that certainly sealed it. Later, she went on to record some icky pop records and star in a series of beach party movies with Frankie Avalon. It was the early 60s version of From Justin to Kelly. By then, she had large helmet hair and never wore string bikinis. But it was a net. Just seeing her without the mouse ears was erotic enough. She disappeared from the public eye and raised her own family. After 25 years, I'd say she was entitled to a little me time. It breaks my heart to think that she suffered the last 20 years of her life with MS and sacrificed a normal childhood to better all of ours. If it's any comfort, she was truly loved by an entire generation. And we mourn her passing deeply. You never forget your first. Thank you, Annette, for being my dear friend, even though I never met you. Ken Levine nailed it again. In the late 1950s and 1960s, before John F. Kennedy was shot, there were only a few public figures who all you had to do was mention the first name and everybody knew who you were talking about. Ike. Jackie, Elvis, Fidel, Marilyn, and Annette was right there with them. She embodied a generation. I wish I were a kid again. Girl, you can't forget. Annette, a lot of people wish you were a kid again. I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer, Sid Tepps. In closing tonight, we're going to do a little special Annette number from an early 1965 Disney movie. Annette was moving out of the public eye. Disney was going to move on to other things, but Walt got her to do a sort of a hybrid beach movie, rock and roll movie, and he managed to get the Beach Boys in suits and ties to do the title number with Annette. Beach Boys, by the way, were influenced a lot growing up by Disney, and I'm sure they were influenced a lot by Annette. Just might be the last time you ever saw the Beach Boys in suits and ties, and there's a great little segment there where Mike Love and Annette do a little bit of the swim together. The LSD, the mysticism, and the drugs would come pretty soon. Probably only Annette could coax out one last bit of innocence from the Beach Boys. Check out the great harmonies between her and the boys in The Monkey's Uncle. And the monkey's uncle say for me, well I don't care what the whole world thinks. She loves the monkey's uncle. Call us a couple of missing links. She loves the monkey's uncle. Rub all his monkey shines. Woo! Every day is Valentine's. I love the monkey's uncle and the monkey's uncle say for me.